So in 25, uh, he's going to get to a Hosea uh, quotation. After he does a little potter and clay stuff, he's going to say, um, he's, I'll start with 22. What if God, desiring to show wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience the vessels of wrath made for destruction? Remember 118, the wrath of God is revealed from uh, heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. What if God has decided to uh, be patient with that in order to make known the riches of God's glory for the vessels of mercy, which God has prepared beforehand for glory? even of us whom God has called. Verse 24, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentile. As indeed, God says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And who was not beloved, I will call my beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called sons, children of the living God. All right? So here, Paul quotes Hosea twice. In, in both of them, this is, this is where I, I, my introduction about how Paul reads scripture here is kind of important that Paul is bringing a completely different read than Israel would have had, than the Jews around him would have had, and a different read than the text itself on its face yields. Because the context in Hosea, where he, where Hosea says, of pity on not pitied, and I will say to not my people, you are my people, Hosea 2.23. And then in, in uh, Hosea 1.10, yet the number of people of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which can be neither measured nor numbered. And in this place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. So, who are, the, who are the people who are going from not people to people? It's the Jews who have been disobedient over time, right? This Hosea passage is about God's promise to receive Israel back in spite of their disobedience, to receive Israel back in God's mercy and have them back. So the passage is about Israel, but who's Paul using it to describe? They used to be a not people, and now there are people, for Paul, that's the Gentile. Now, if, if that seems a little roughshod for Paul to be running over scripture that way, let's consider, though, why was Israel at odds with God in Hosea in the first place? Because they had worshipped idols and gone away from God's way. The very things that Jews in Paul's time might have said, that's why Gentiles aren't in on this. In other words, the indictment of Hosea against Israel stands for Paul, but it's not just against Israel, it's against Gentiles, and now God has received Gentiles back just as God promised through Hosea to receive Jews back. Are you with me? It's all kind of confusing, but you see the, the, the work of Paul here is to widen the reach of God's covenant. He's been doing that since the indictment in chapters one to three. Remember, Paul started by indicting Jews who were uh, Gentiles who worship idols and and all of the sort of chapter one stuff about uh, how they they knew God because of creation, but they decided not to worship God and turn to things that they made with their hands. Right. So chapter one, he indicted Gentiles for idolatry and for not honoring God as God. Chapters two and into three, he indicts the Jews who have not obeyed God. Here, Paul gets back to that and says, I may as well use a passage from Hosea that talks about a people who were once not a people, but now have become one for Gentiles, just as, as we could use it for Jews. Do you see? Paul is widening the reach of the blessing that he's been setting up since he started, 1, 16 and 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jews chronologically first, but also to the Greeks. Right? 
Paul is continuing that line. So the people who say that 9 through 11 is kind of a tangent Paul takes, an afterthought that he throws in because he's he's tussling with it, I think are wrong. This stays right on Paul's line of argument that he's had since 116, namely the surface is level and Gentiles are now a part of the covenant of God through Jesus who has taken laws and advantage out of play. Now he's reminding Israel that you didn't use the advantage of law, you disobeyed God. So there was a time when you were not a people and there was a long time when Gentiles were not a people. God is saying, I will make you all a people. Hosea expanded. Make sense? All right. Next, we get to, I'm going to skip 9.29 and Isaiah 1.9. Um, no, no, actually, I need it for what we're doing. In, in, in Romans 9.29, Paul in 27 to 29 says, I, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel or children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will execute sentence upon the earth with rigor and dispatch. And as Isaiah predicted, he says, if the Lord of hosts had not left us children, we would have fared like Sodom and been made like Gomorrah. Throughout the, the prophets, there is mention of a remnant of Israel uh, that that holds on true when everybody else is false. It continues Paul's theme that there are subsets within God's promise. Think of it as, because you and I think individually, we think of each person, our culture at least, uh, moves us, 20, 21st century uh, Western culture at least, and blessedly not all of us are from 21st century Western culture, so I don't want to assume, but 21st century Western culture has moved us toward being the most individualistic population in the history of the world. So when we read things about salvation, we think in individual terms. Paul thought in terms of whole people. So I want you to imagine, have, if you've ever been to a vigil, a candlelight vigil, where your church had, had people praying all night, but it wasn't all the people praying all night. Somebody went in at 9 to 9.30, and then somebody came in at 9.30 to spell them until 10, and so on. It was a sort of relay race in which the candle was always burning, even if the whole church wasn't there, right? And I want you to think of Paul's way of imagining this stuff in those terms. He thinks in terms of a church and not just an individual person. And he thinks in terms of Israel and not just an individual Israelite. Gentiles, not just an individual Gentile. And so he's, he's sort of doing the law of large numbers here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip the rest of these passages because we need to move on. I just wanted you to see in the way Paul reads scripture that Paul is willing to widen the original meaning because he sees parallels between Israel's disobedience and the Gentiles' state from the beginning. Right? He sees they were all at some point not a people, and God has welcomed now all of them. Even though Israel's had the law, they've had the promises, all those things, everybody's allowed in now and on equal footing. All right? 